Hello and welcome to History by Hollywood, a podcast series that examines the real events and people behind fact-based movies. This is episode 8, due Sunday the 7th of May 2017, and today's movie is 1964 Zulu, starring Stanley Baker, Michael Caine and Jack Hawkins. My name is Andrew Bliszczyk and with me as ever is Martin Darlington. Hello everybody, Um, just a quick update uh, for a reason yet to be determined. YouTube have removed our last episode, Bridge of Spies, and issued a community strike warning against us. Uh, They haven't specified in what way we've breached their guidelines. We've scoured the guidelines and we can't find any reason. Um, So we have appealed and asked for clarification, but uh, as of a week after that was sent, we haven't had any replies. Um, The YouTube channel was initially started because a few listeners asked for an alternative to iTunes. Mm. As we now stream on SoundCloud, we're hoping that this, together with the option of listening direct from the website, will provide sufficient coverage. And if that proves to be the case, we'll stop broadcasting on YouTube after this episode. Um, But if any listeners, and there are several who have subscribed to the YouTube channel, would like us to persist, we'll happily do so, um, provided you get to hear this episode and this doesn't get taken down for some reason. And so we've already mentioned in this introduction the movie Zulu, obviously, and Zulu Dawn as a prequel. Um, It's pretty hard to start describing Zulu without drifting into Zulu Dawn territory. Zulu Dawn was made quite a bit later, but there are some links between the two movies. It it portrays the events immediately before uh, what happened in Zulu. Exactly, yeah. Um, Just moving on to listener feedback. Um, Listener Susan Jones, hello. She wrote in, Quote, loving the podcast. I'm a fan of history and historical fiction. I'm also a history teacher, so it's handy to know where films and reality diverge. You mentioned a list of upcoming films. Could you consider adding one about a woman? I know Hollywood prefers to make movies about white men, so it's not easy finding good movies that don't fit that pattern, but I hope you'll think about it. Your comments on issues of diversity, for example, the portrayal of the Persians in 300, have been thoughtful and interesting. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, and since then we've we've had a, a to and fro with Susan, and it's it's lovely to have a history teacher yeah, give us a, sure a seal of right. approval. Um, yeah, and the various suggestions have come up. She makes a very good point, and we should definitely. There, there are several historical films about female characters, and we've had several ideas. One has been Duchess, looking at the uh, 18th century Duchess of Devonshire, Georgiana, who has a lot of parallels with Princess Diana. We, there's the Iron Lady with Meryl Streep. Andrew's had some... Uh... There's uh, Cleopatra back in the 60s, of course. Um, more recently, the NASA mathematicians in the movie Hidden Figures. And even the story about the author of Mary Poppins being wooed by Walt Disney. It's a very interesting movie called yes. Saving Mr. Banks. Yeah, and that's not what I'm familiar with. That would be an interesting one. If Susan or anyone else has a uh, suggestion, and we do want to make sure we're not just doing... Um, war films concentrating on the white men winning yeah. Yeah. or losing Good as the case may be so our um, projected next films uh, we think we're going to adjust because we do reserve the right to laugh at ourselves when at the end of this show having just covered Zulu a 50 year old military epic we announce that next time out we'll be covering Waterloo which I think a is a 40 nearly, year old yeah 40 odd year old military epic, military epic. Um, we have Cameron Riley coming on for that to guest host uh, I'll mention Cameron again in a moment, um, but so, so that, that timing, unfortunately, is unavoidable. But wonderful that we have a diverse listenership. Yeah. Please bear with us, and we will get to something, hopefully, a little bit more diverse than we've done. Great. Okay, continuing news of reviews. Um, we've got a, an iTunes review, but we've only just realised that the UK iTunes site, where Martin generally connects to, only shows reviews from UK reviewers. So, having had a look elsewhere in the world, with all apologies, if these are way out of date, here are a couple more reviews received. Thank you, thank you for them. Tfin27 left us a positive review on iTunes USA, which was much appreciated, very thoughtful. Tfin, we hope you're still enjoying the show and having praised the wide range of movies we've covered so far, hope you can bear with us through the next couple of episodes for the reasons Martin's already mentioned. That said, any younger listeners who haven't seen movies like Zulu, or Waterloo, they really don't age and are very well, uh, very well worth a watch. No CGI, thousands of extras, and some pretty powerful stories. 
Um, friend of the show and soon to be guest host Cameron Riley had posted a review on the Australian site and he entitled it Where Does Hollywood Get It Right and Wrong About History? And he, he's getting revenge on me. He's written us a poem. He says, A history nerd from Australia and a Brit who's a helicopter sailor dissect Hollywood history films and explain the real facts to the childrens. I guess that's an abbreviation of children. Well wedged in there. Did Russell Crowe's brave gladiator really say, I'm glad that I ate her? Did Commodus the Emperor know that his reign wasn't as short as it's shown? My only advice to you blokes is to add a few more dick jokes. We all know that's the secret ingredient to making a podcast expedient. I'll leave you now, Don Corleone, because I know you are a very busy man. So thanks, Carl. Very impressive, thank we'll you. we'll speak to you soon. And, and now, now, on with the show. Okay, so Zulu. Well, first of all, we should tell you what sources that we've used uh, for, for our information. And one of the fascinating ones is the official narrative of the field operations connected with the Zulu War of 1879, which is a amalgamation of regimental records and official unit diaries. So contemporaries of the events. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, unfortunately, wow. it's not available on Kindle, but you can, it's still in print, you can buy it. I've got a copy myself. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Uh, also, there was Like Wolves on the Fold, The Defence of Rourke's Drift by Mike Snook, who is a former company commander at the Royal Regiment of Wales, who um, the 24th of foot uh, and, uh, ended up becoming part of for the last uh, several decades. Rourke's Drift, 1879, uh, by Edmund York was another one. He's a senior lecturer at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. And most of the modern sources draw extensively on memoirs. This is something we really saw, I think, start in the Crimean War, where a lot of other ranks were literate, uh, other than, uh, unlike with the Napoleonic War, where they're very few and far between. Um, so there's been a lot of accounts, there were a lot of contemporary accounts, and, I mean, one of them, Charles Norris Newman, who was a, a newspaper correspondent, his In Zululand with the British Army is a fascinating read, although very coloured by the correspondent's personal opinions, Again, not available on Kindle, unfortunately, but is still in print. And he's played in the movie Zulu Dawn wonderfully by Ronald Glacey as a rather unlikable smug observer. Okay, other sources. Um, well, there's the extensive previous reading by Martin, including Ian Knight's Nothing Remains But To Fight, also unavailable on Kindle. There are a number of documentaries you can watch, many on YouTube. Search for Zulu War 1879 or Rock's Drift. One comment we have to make on the sources is they vary quite markedly from opinion to opinion. Some say this was a fairly irrelevant action by a Zulu raiding party and the defenders showed little imagination or initiative and one due to the firepower of their rifles. Others say that this was a determined action by a large Zulu impi, which is what, Martin? An impi it's a, basically it's a group of regiments. It's a battle group or a corps, you okay. could say. And uh, this impi was intent on sweeping into Natal and wiping out uh, the settlements there. Shard and Bromhead, uh, in, from the movie and from history, are portrayed as either innovative, energetic, inspirational leaders or dull, passed over, ageing lieutenants who were carried by their non-commissioned officers and soldiers to fame and victory. We will voice some of our own opinions uh, as we go forward, um, but they should be by no means considered uh, definitive, uh, as with all of our podcasts. But then no historian or commentator can realistically claim to have a definitive answer to events that happened over a hundred years ago. And just before we move on to the movie, I'd like to perhaps state the obvious that this is clearly in Martin's wheelhouse. The battle, the events, <laughs> it means a lot to him. He's done very much most of the heavy lifting for this episode, so thanks for your work, Martin. Well, thank you for the, thank you. Um, <laughs> so setting the scene, um, Lord Chelmsford, who's mentioned at the beginning of the movie where we see his, or hear his dispatch to London announcing a huge defeat of British forces at Isandwana. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Lord Chelmsford, he's commander of the British forces in Natal, which is a South African province, which today is known as KwaZulu-Natal, and it's on the eastern coast of modern South Africa. Durban is its largest town. Um, Sir Bartle Frere, who was a very highly thought of colonial troubleshooter, he was the colonial high commissioner, and him and Chelmsford got together 
to try and solve what they saw as the Zulu problem. Now the Zulus were, I mean thinking back to 300, they were very much like the Spartans. They were a very military orientated uh, society, very sophisticated culture. The, the boys were taken from their families mm. and trained and trained and then regiments when they had washed their spears as they referred to it and earned their positions as warriors they would be married en masse and in one of the early scenes in Zulu you That's actually see nice. a regiment being married off to their girls. Yeah, it's very um, Spartan isn't it? So yeah. The boys from their family at a young age. Absolutely. Um, now Chelmsford and Sabatel Frere came up with a um, uh, basically a raft of restrictions and conditions uh, an ultimatum to King Ketchwe over the Zulu nation. He had to disband his regiment, cease raiding across the Natal, Natal border, and accept a raft of other restrictions uh, that they knew quite clearly. And, and it, Zulu Dawn portrays this very well, how cynical they are. And, and basically, they, they also, I think, they gave until lunchtime on Tuesday to respond, which was, it was just unrealistic, either the time frame or the demands they made. Of course, when he didn't respond positively, as far as they were concerned, they had their excuse to invade. I think Zulu Dawn was 1978? 78, 79, yeah. 14, 15, uh, 14, 15 years after Zulu? Yeah, Peter O'Toole plays Lord Chelmsford, uh, and he's a wonderfully creepy, sinister character in it. I'm not quite sure the real Chelmsford like that. He was, doesn't, you don't sound that, it doesn't sound as if he was the most. Um, intelligently rounded man right. he was good battlefield commander uh, but he was very connected mm -hmm. um, hence Lord I guess he um, invaded in three columns into in Zulu land and he accompanied the center column fatally underestimating the Zulu's ability to move large numbers of warriors very quickly he established a camp on the slopes of a hill known as Izandwana um, it looks like a, a lion lying down on the top of it. Mm. Still there today, the Lion's Hill. Then he split his first four, force further and headed deeper into Zululand after receiving what proved to be erroneous reports of a large body of Zulu seen in that direction. Uh, the men left behind there was about thirteen to fifteen hundred uh, British troops and another five or six hundred native troops under command of Lieutenant Colonel Pauline, who's played in Zulu Dawn by Den Home Elliot. American actor, yeah. Don Hume Elliot's British, I oh, believe. I'm confusing yeah. someone else. My um, his orders were to secure the camp, uh, which he seemed to think involved sitting around and actually not doing anything. And they were attacked by 20,000 Zulus. We won't go into the details of why the attack happened exactly when it did, but basically the position was overrun. Uh, there were a lot of failings on the part of the British command, and it was the worst defeat of armed British troops by what were termed native troops. Uh, ever and only three years after the Americans, the U.S. Army suffered exactly the same at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So, just to clarify things a little bit, Martin's just described the events that are portrayed in Zulu Dawn, the prequel to the Zulu movie we're discussing now. On the now. morning of the twenty-second of January, eighteen seventy-nine, and it was a disaster. Um, over a thousand British soldiers were slaughtered by the twenty thousand Zulus, and then comes the event of Rourke's Drift, yeah. uh, which is portrayed in the movie Zulu. Yeah, 12 miles away from his Andwana, there is a single company, the 2nd Battalion, the 24th Foot, uh, and they're stationed at Rourke's Drift. It's a small missionary state station that had been commandeered as a stores depot and a hospital facility. What does 24th Foot, does that mean the infantry? 24th Regiment of Foot. Foot yeah, means? Yeah, Foot means infantry. infantry. Yeah. Okay. Um, so they were the, uh, so they referred to themselves as the 24th. Right. And we had Lieutenant John Chard, who was Royal Engineers, he'd been sent there to build a bridge across the river, the drift. The, Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, Acting Company Commander, B Company, 24th Foot. Uh, James Dalton, who we will come back to in great detail, uh, Acting Assistant Commissary, Army Commissariat and Transport Department. So basically he's in charge of stores. And Colonel Sergeant? Colour Sergeant. Colour Sergeant, thank you. Frank Bourne, B Company, 24th Foot. The Zulu MP that swept down onto Rourke's Drift or towards Rourke's Drift, so three to four thousand. Now these were guys who'd been held in reserve for Izandwana, and if the Zulus had their battlefield of their choosing, they used to actually make the reserve sit with their backs to the battle. So they wouldn't get overexcited oh, and they wouldn't launch too early. And, um, and they were very, very well drilled and very well organised. Um, 
But Prince Dabula Manzi, who was half-brother to King Ketchueo, a brave, if somewhat reckless leader, he led his regiment with the rest of this impi, with other regiments included, and said, look, we need to wash our spears. Let's go and attack Rourke's Drift. So kind of without orders, they went a little bit off the reservation, if you forgive the, uh, the pun, and um, asked later why they attacked Kwa Jim, as the Zulu knew uh, Rourke's Drift, because it was built by a settler called Jim Rourke. Kwa Jim, um, as the Zulus called it, his answer was, we wanted the, our boys to wash their spears, which is a, a <laughs> euphemistic way of saying we wanted to kill some people yeah. and earn yeah, our spurs. Okay, so this might be a good time to dispel a few myths about the battle. While it's certainly true that the 24th Foot was later incorporated into the Royal Regiment of Wales, and before that amalgamation was known as the South Wales Borderers, the latter title wasn't given to the regiment until 1881, after the battle portrayed in Zulu, uh, as part of a wholesale reorganisation of the army. At the time of the Zulu War, their title was 24th Foot and 2nd Warwickshire Regiment. The regimental depot had moved to Brecon, which is in South Wales, a few years before, so there was a slightly higher proportion of Welshmen than usually found in an English regiment, but still only about 12 to 15 per cent. And they had no official choir, no. as suggested in the movie. The other part, the element of the film that, that is kind of just completely off. made up, but I, I'm hoping we'll manage to work out a reason for it, is the Swedish missionary played in the film by Jack Hawkins, whose name was Otto Witt. Uh, he did operate his, uh, from the chapel at the, missionary, uh, at the mission station, but he played no part in the action at all. He'd been stood on top of a nearby hill with Chaplain Smith, who was there throughout the action, handing out ammunition, but, but he, ignored in the movie. he completely ignored in the movie. Um, when they saw the Zulu Impi approaching, Witt ran back to the station and quite understandably jumped on his horse and rode to his nearby um, a farm where to get his family out. Yeah. Um, Witt claimed later that he had, this is the real Otto Witt, that he preached to Ketchwayo and believed he was on the verge of converting the Zulu king to Christianity, but most historians view Witt and his accounts as highly unreliable. So, um, great character and we'll come back to him in our description of the scenes. Yeah. So, I think we should start looking at the opening scenes of the movie. So before we dissect the scenes of the movie, let's tell the story of the movie itself, very briefly. Zulu is a 1964 blockbuster set in South Africa. It portrays the battle between the colonising British Army and Zulu warriors at Rourke's Drift in January of 1879. It starred British actor Stanley Baker and a very youthful Michael Caine. It was directed by American screenwriter Cy Enfield. It was produced by Enfield as well as the film's main star, Stanley Baker. I th think as well. I think this was Michael Caine's first named role. Major role, that's for sure. Yeah. He's in the credits at the start. Like, it's with. And introducing Not Michael like Caine, isn't it? Yeah. And just that whole link between Zulu and Zulu Dawn, where you, you end up talking about both whenever you talk about the other, um, I think that uh, Zulu Dawn, the screenwriter, was the director of this movie, Cy Enfield, who was mainly Again. known to Hollywood as a screenwriter. Right. So they called him in for the sequel 14 years later. Wow. Um, it's based on a lengthy article on the conflict called The Battle of Rourke's Drift. It was a critical and box office success, costing $3.5 million to make and taking $8 million at the box office. Uh, it doesn't seem to have won any major awards in its release, but is often listed as one of the greatest British movies of all time and currently has a 93% positive score on Rotten Tomatoes. It has entered popular culture, Martin, as a high watermark in British cinema? Yeah, certainly amongst... Men. <laughs> <laughs> of a certain age. Yeah. It was shot in studios in England and mainly on site in South Africa. It runs for two hours and 18 minutes. So the, the, uh, the film opens with the aftermath of Isandlwana, the just, uh, back, wreckage of the battle. Just battlefield. becoming known yeah. by the protagonist. Red jacketed movie. bodies all over the place. And then cuts to Ketchwayo's Kral, his uh, village where Dancing Warriors are about to particip participate in a mass marriage. That's easy for me to say. Missionary Otto Witt, played by Jack Hawkins, and his daughter are speaking or sat with Quechuao uh, when a messenger arrives with news of the victory at Isandlwana. 
Wit hears of the Zulu intention to destroy their mission station at Rourke's Drift and they jump in their carriage and ride off. And Wit and his daughter are um, supposedly Swedish missionaries. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, then we, the next scene we see for the first time the main players. Uh, Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead is out hunting. He's played by uh, Michael Caine. Lieutenant John Shard is labouring to make a bridge. Uh, yeah, and there's a, there's a few bits and pieces of uh, the the, uh, the contrast between Bromhead out yeah, shooting yeah. And, and missing a leopard and yeah, uh, a bit of a I think a leopard Brando. or a cheetah. Yes, yeah, a bit of a, 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 a dandy. Yeah. And John Shard getting down and dirty, down with shirt sleeves in the water. And then Bromhead rides down, sees him, and we have this rather wonderful encounter. Who are you? John Shard, Royal Engineers. Bromhead, 24. I'll tell my man to clean your kit. Don't bother. No bother. Not offering to clean it myself. Still, a chap ought to look smart in front of the men. Don't you think? Well, chin chin, do carry on with your mud pies. Great stuff. Uh, next, the next scene we see Colour Sergeant Bourne, played by Nigel Green, strolling around and keeping an eye on the troops. We cut to the hospital, and for the first time we see Private Hook, who's introduced as a slightly anarchic figure. We also meet Sergeant Maxfield, who has a fever and is delirious. Yeah, uh, going back to Lieutenant Chard, oh, he see. meets Private Owen, who's practising going la 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 And he says to him, uh, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm practising for the choir, but you've got my top tenner in the water. <laughs> Something. Sorry, do please forgive the dreadful Welsh accent. Um, having worked there for eight years, it should be better than that. And he says, every Welsh regiment has a choir. And it's around this point that two riders are seen heading fast towards the post at Rourke's Drift. Corporal Allen appears and he offers to defend the unfinished bridge that the men had just been working on from a, a, a tethered pontoon as part of the construction that's in the middle of the bridge, even though there's no word of any threat quite yet. Yeah, that, I think they've obviously they've heard something. Yeah, it doesn't really show in the film, but I think you know that they know something's gone on. They, they would have heard artillery from 12 miles away quite easily. So the two riders arrive, one of whom is Lieutenant Ardendorf. Of yeah. the He's a boar. He's a boar. He's played as a South, South African, yeah. Yeah, and Bromhead says to him, well, is it true? Uh, and I'm not quite sure what he's heard we, we before this stage. And what, like... The L Lieutenant Adendorf is a very sympathetic character. He helps them out a lot as the local on the ground, but I'm trying to figure out where the relationship between the British and the Boers were about then. Yeah, yes, it's before, before the First, first World War. War. Okay. And so, basically, um, and we'll get onto this a bit, he has some interesting things to say, Adendorf, later, but he's come from his unwind and he said, no, the whole column's had the chop, basically. And Bromhead and Chard start both making different decisions and they compare commissioning dates to, to determine who should who who's got senior, seniority and Bromhead says oh don't tell me um, you're going to be senior you know and he, he's May 1872 and Chard is February 1872 because so, Bromhead is simply a, an engineer in, no no Chard, Chard is an engineer. engineer in Bromhead's eyes yeah but yeah and, and Bromhead's you know so, uh, has this dreadfully put down thing well I suppose there is such a thing as a gifted amateur yeah. um, but they yeah so Chad Senior so he's the officer commanding it's the way that the, the army works at this point Otto Witt arrives and the also reference. says Quechuao is coming with two impies to wipe you out so I think before we go on we should just Di return di dissect the history so far yeah um, Wit the scene with Wit at Ketchware's Kral uh, is not true on this day he was at Rourke's Drift and his family were not there then he rode away to save his family um, the, the Bromhead thing is interesting the more I read about Bromhead um, he was said to be a good man in the mess he was, he was popular with his colleagues but very shy and mm. this seems to have led some senior officers to have viewed him as a bit dull. But just to go to basics, they're both uh, Bromhead and Shard are, are, are real figures with the right names in the yeah. right place at the right time. With the right unit. Their commissioning dates are wrong. Chard when they're, when they're trying to determine seniority, they're yeah. a few months apart, three months apart. I'd yeah, think. in reality, Chard was commissioned in 68, so he's an 11-year lieutenant, and Bromhead was 71, and he was 
one of the last people in the British Army who purchased his, his commission was bought. Oh. So they basically bought their way in, and that was a practice that Sir Garnet Wolseley, who we'll come to later, um, stamped out. He said, no, people should be commissioned on merit, not on you know, how much money their family have got. Uh, although the Duke of Wellington had a purchase commission, and oh, if he hadn't, um, we probably, he probably wouldn't have raised the senior as he was. So Charlie's 31 at the time of Rorke's Drift, Bromhead 34. It's, in my opinion, the most fascinating character in the whole thing is Colour Sergeant Frank Bourne. Is he the guy with the mutton chops, yeah? Yeah, the big mutton chops. And Nigel Green gives a wonderful, wonderful performance. And we'll have have a number of clips of Nigel Green playing Colour Sergeant Bourne. And again, all that's right, there was a Sergeant Bourne and he... You know, yep. he was the cover sergeant. He was. I got that right as well. He was very inspirational and he was hugely respected. But he was actually 23 years old at the time of Rorke's mm-hmm. Drift. The year before, he'd been promoted and he was the youngest color sergeant in the British wow. Army. He was five foot six. His nickname was The Kid. And you can hear an interview with him. It's not his voice, it's oh, a transcript. From, oh, what's On uh, YouTube, which was done by the BBC, I believe, in the 40s. He was interviewed in the 30s or 40s. Wow. Because um, he didn't die till VE Day 1945. Wow, that's amazing. Talk about the, what, you know, what skipping. Because we tend to look at it, we've said this time and time again, you look at a historical period almost in isolation. You do, but this guy... Nothing else happened before or since. This guy survived Rock Ridge, he survived the, the Boer War, his First yeah, World War, the Depression, was, the Second World War. He was commissioned uh, and he commanded a school of musketry in Kent and then retired. Then the First World War came around and he went to Dublin. He was one of the British officers chosen to go and negotiate with the Irish rebels in 1916 to the Easter Uprising because he was mm-hmm. seen as... He'll be able to... He, he won't be an aristocratic, snobby... Brit, but he, he retired as a lieutenant colonel and he is just a fascinating character. But 23, yeah. so nothing like Nigel Green, however wonderful Nigel Green's character playing is. Okay, then we've got Private Hook. Remember, yeah. he's the guy in the hospital that we said was slightly anarchic and, you know, probably a malingerer trying to avoid hard work by saying he's, by being in the hospital. Throughout the movie, he is not portrayed very sympathetically. Um, however, they took a bit of license with Hook, quite a bit. Hook at the time was not in hospital, he was not under house arrest and was in fact an exemplary soldier. Um, his yeah, fa- the implication I think is he joined the army after being caught as a yeah. thief and given one of those jobs. That's right, as an alternative to jail. Well, yeah, uh, and that's not true at all. He, he'd run a farm in uh, Warwickshire, Warwickshire, it had failed, he joined the army having had to sell up. And he just had his duty that day was hospital cook, cook. go in and cook food for the lads. Um, yeah, we mentioned the choir. The reference to the it choir, which is a great book for Welsh, uh, yeah, for Welsh uh, infantry or regiment. But you know that, that Martin's already. And, and if I'm, not. if we're upsetting Welsh people, being told that Rorke's Drift, there were a few Welshmen there, but there were just as many Boer, Scots, oh. Irish. You know, we're not upsetting you. It's the it's facts. It's the history, yeah. So I'm sorry, but we are we are slaves to the truth. Okay. What a, moving on then? What about the Boer Lieutenant Adendorf? Yeah, and what's interesting, um, several of the commentators I've read on this say, for him to have reached Rorke's Drift as quickly as he did, he must have left his Andwana pretty much as the first Zulu mm. attack rolled in which kind of implies he didn't stay very long to oh, fight. Oh, so I having see. said that, he did remain at Rourke's Drift throughout the defence and made a valuable contribution. Yeah. Um, the bit about Corporal Allen offering to defend the unfinished bridge is true, but it wasn't Corporal Allen, although he is another genuine character who we'll come back to. It was actually a Sergeant Milne of the 3rd Buffs uh, who what? made the offer. Buffs? Uh, it is a regiment. Right. It was just the name of a regiment. I think they were South Coast uh, England. And basically what we've got with Ardendorf and Witt and then shortly afterwards, which we'll describe shortly, Lieutenant Stevenson arriving, there were actually multiple fugitives seen. Um, some stopped, said, you're going to die, yeah, and legged it, as the in reality show. this is. Yeah. Um, but some just were seen riding past, they were not stopping. They, they, were, they were heading for the coast and you know, trying to catch a ship back to England, I think. Okay, so... Back to the movie. So where are we at? We're, we've got the r- rumours becoming confirmed about a massacre the day before? or No, the, no, that morning. That morning. That morning. But the, yeah. Well, but when was the massacre? The day before? No, that morning. Oh, I Only see. Only 12 miles away. 
Oh, I see. So that's, that's like, you know, less than two and, that, and that's all true. That's all correct. Yeah, yep, absolutely. They didn't speed up the time, the time fly. 13 to 1,400 oh, wow. British soldiers, five to 600 native soldiers killed. And within 24 hours, a rock drift occurs. No, less than that. No, yeah, same yeah, day. It's the same. same day. That, <coughs> after, that happens in the morning, in the afternoon. Wow. Um, so well, you do get that sense of urgency in the movie of impending doom and yeah. and things moving very quickly to confirm what all the rumours that they're hearing have happened and that they're under threat now too. Yes. So back to the film, Sergeant Windridge, who is another real character, uh, a strapping guy by all accounts, and he's certainly portrayed as that. He's the sergeant with all the muscles in the yeah. film. Um, he sends two of the Welsh lads to the top of a hill and says, you've got a good voice, sing out if you see anything. <laughs> So they go up there, and meanwhile, Chard is organising preparations to defend the base by building walls from mealy bags and biscuit boxes. In the hospital, Hook is uh, accused of being a thief by Sergeant Maxfield, and we also meet a few more characters. The Joneses, um, both Welsh soldiers uh, uh, in the hospital, and they are talking to Corporal Sheese, who is a Swiss guy, but he was a member of the Natal, uh, actually he was a member of the Natal native contingent, um, but in the film they describe him as a member of the mounted police and one of the Welsh lads says to his other, oh, he's a peeler, come to arrest the Zulu, <laughs> which is a lovely turn of phrase, but she's genuine character, Jones and Jones, Robert and William, both genuine characters. What about L- Lieutenant Stevenson? Yeah, now Lieutenant Stevenson of Durnford's horse arrives and <laughs> It's really quite a dramatic scene. A child almost sort of loses it because yeah. he says to him, he knows right, um, he said, I, I'll send your men out as, as pickets. You know what? Um, how the Zulus feel about horses? And Stephen says, I know how my men feel about Zulus. <laughs> Sorry, no, you're the professionals. We're going back to die on our farm sort of thing. Right. Well, in the film, it's implied that all his troopers are boars. They yeah. actually had a, half a dozen European NCOs, but the rest, they were the Natal native contingent mounted. They were like relative to the Zulus, but fighting for the British. Yeah, okay. And the film, but the film shows them leaving. But Chad is going, calling, "Don't go! Don't leave us! We need you! Damn you!" Yeah. Which is not really going to Work. sort of cheer the men up. No. And then there's this stunned silence. The men realise what's going to happen to them, yeah. or likely to happen to them. And they're staring after them. And again, we've got, this is our first example of the wonderful oh. Nigel Green As, portraying um, Colour Sergeant Bourne. Colour Sergeant Bourne. All right, then. Nobody told you to stop working. So the preacher wit um, knows the Zulus are coming and it's not looking good. He tells all the native troops that they're doomed and they um, promptly run off so that they can survive. They've hooked it, sir. All of them. Yes. Then Lieutenant Adendorf, the Boer, uh, brief Shard and Bromhead about standard Zulu battle tactics, tactics, and he uses this in terms of drawing in the sand, representation of buffalo horns, pointing in towards each other, so that, that these flanks of buffalo, uh, buffalo horns depicted in the sand, will be the Zulu troops, uh, like a classic pincer movement, encircling yeah, the back they, of they the. They tend to use the young, fast, fitter. Um, Zulus. It's very like the Roman three rank system of the youngest guys at the front mm. who are agile, then the, the, the more experienced guys in the middle and the real veterans okay. at the rear. And they kind of did this, so the fast guys went out and encircled the enemy and then would push them in towards the loins of the buffalo as he describes mm. it. Um, and uh, encircle the yeah. enemy and crush them. And during this uh, Ardendorf's explanation there's a little bit of to and fro banter between him and the uh, two British officers uh, and at one point it I think it's Chad says, well, don't you want our help against the Zulu? And Andor says quite presciently, yes, but what will you damn English want for it afterwards? Mm-hmm. What will be the price, you know? And I think that's, it's got some really interesting nuances, this film and how it portrays things. Yeah. Okay, so next we see Chad, who has uh, the remaining wagons overturned to make barriers against the Zulus. Um, yeah, because Wit's been trying to persuade him yeah. to let him take the sick. On, um, on the on the yeah. remaining wagons, and Wits, Wits getting more and more desperate, knowing what's coming, and he tries to take the sick from the hospital, but Shard ignores him and uses the remaining wagons as a barricade. Um, so Wit, the Reverend Wit, being more and more panicky, they decide to imprison, secure both him and his daughter. Which yeah. mm. Brom, Bromhead then tells off Shard for giving Private Hook, remember him in the hospital. 
the malingerer, thief, coward, and insubordinate barrack room lawyer uh, for giving him a rifle. In mid, mid sentence, he stops as they all listen to the distant noise that sounds like an oncoming train. Yeah, it's really well done, that, isn't it? And, and it's this obviously is the, 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 the Zulus, the Zulus clashing their assegai spears against their shields. Um, and during this phase, there's a slightly comic character of the cook uh, with assistant commissary James Dalton, who's portrayed slightly as a slightly camp character, and they're distributing ammunition um, around the lads. <laughs> And I think before we go on to the next bit, we'll just go back and look at the reality of this. Okay. Um, the sending of the sentries to the top of the hill. So this is the reality check for the second phase. Yeah. In truth, Colonel Sergeant Born to actually took out a platoon of men. Well, it's described as a section, but we believe it was between 20 and 30 men. And they lay out a picket. But also, oh. Lieutenant Stevenson did deploy his men as scouts. Right. It was when they detected the Zulu MP approaching, then they came back in, told Chad and Bromhead they're coming. they're coming. The native troops didn't stop. No. They kept going. Stevenson called out something about, I'll, I'll, I'll go and fetch my guys back, and left. And this infuriated the British defenders who had already had their, at, the, or at this stage, their um, infantry nat Natal native contingent did leg it, right. so their numbers have gone from 450 down to like less than, or just only just over 130 of right. able-bodied men. And some of the defenders did shoot at Good. the riding away horsemen, and one of the European NCOs, a Corporal Anderson, was actually killed. Um, so, I mean, really, it's a crime's been committed. Yeah. It's never reported officially. Lots of people mentioned it, but not Nothing in official better. reports, and it was kind of, yeah, we're not going to go into that in too much depth. Officially, I think Anderson was killed by enemy action. Yeah, and then we have it confirmed that our suspicions about Private Hook being a malingerer, a thief and a coward, uh, an insupport and barrack room lawyer, um, which was not true at all. We've already mentioned that they portray him uh, badly uh, and incorrectly. Yeah, um, and this is really where I start to question why Chard... It's funny, when the film came out, I think a lot of people looked at it and said, wow, amazing, incredibly brave, these guys that... I mean, that must all have true. been bowel-wateringly scary. Um, and, but then there was almost like a revisionist approach of actually Brom, Bromhead was deaf in one ear and they were, they'd been lieutenants for both of them, you know, approaching in just over a decade respectively, Bromhead and Chard, and didn't really do that much except just sort of stand and, and shoot guns. Actually, this is where Chard not only reinforces the outer wall, but then starts to build what he called retrenchment positions where they could fall back to. Also, he's now had to shorten his perimeter because he's lost 300 so many, many. native troops. But what isn't shown in the film is James Dalton, the assistant, acting assistant commissariat, Chard gives him credit. He was the one who said, I've got a store full of mealy bags there. They're like sandbags. Yeah. I've got a store full of biscuits, biscuits, metal biscuit tins. Let's use those. Now, what isn't clear in the film is James Dalton was a company sergeant major for over 20 years in the British Army. He was decorated. He was a renowned good fighter. Uh, I don't mean in punch-ups in the bar. I mean, you know, in the terms of he'd seen a lot of action. He left the army, gone back to London, didn't settle at home, joined the, the commissariat to... Um, department as a effectively a commissioned officer um, so so dalton who in a, in reality came up with the ideas for the barricade and was a, a you know forthright well, he came up with the ideas of what they could use what they to could build use, yeah. them and yeah, Char, yeah, yeah. Char, all the way through gave said it was and it was me bromed and dalton that came up with the plan and the means to carry it out the movie decides to play this um upright James Dalton figure as that somewhat camp character yeah. and also um, the teetotaling hook um, as a bit of a booze boozer and uh, malingerer. Yeah, so they needed. I think there is a, a, a theme of redem redemption with the movie's private hook. Maybe that's why they took that twist. Anyway. Yeah, certainly possible. Um, okay, so that's the latest update on reality. I think we're going to go back to the movie and we've just got a series of very short clips with Colour Sergeant Bourne, who even though he bears virtually no resemblance, apart from the uniform and the rank, to the real Colour Sergeant Bourne, 
does give you uh, people who may not have experienced it firsthand. This is just a wonderful example of the steadying influence of a good senior NCO. Obviously, having been a senior NCO, I like to think of myself as good. Of I'm a bit of a fan. But uh, So this is the first one. This is Colour Sound Bourne reporting that the sentries are in. The sentries report Zulus to the southwest. Thousands of them. All right, Colour Sergeant. Stand to. Stand to! So the troops stand to, and for anyone unfamiliar with that, that basically means take up your defensive positions. And Bourne goes around checking them, and Fred Hitch, who is another character that comes up again and again in the film, um, he has a quick word in his ear. Hitch, do you tuning up? Me tuning? Do it up. Where do you think you are, man? And I love the comment there from Bourne of, where do you think you are, man? It's like, well, I'm on an African battlefield and quite probably about to die. <laughs> but, um, then the Reverend Witt, who has clearly got his hands on a bottle of intoxicating liquor, yeah. is trying to wind up the guard. The sentry's been put on there and we'll just hear the end of that conversation and Bourne coming along and calming Cheering everything down man. again. I do love this fella. Obey the word, boy. Obey the Lord. Go to the others. Boy, go to the others. Mr. Witt says... Never mind him, boy. Now you cut along back to the ramparts with your mates. Yes, sir. Mr. Witt, sir. Be quiet now, will you? There's a good gentleman. You'll upset the lads. So, yeah, the, the Reverend Witt is still busy trying to scare the men and get drunk. Meanwhile, uh, Lieutenant Bromhead is talking to Lieutenant Chard. Bromhead mentions the fact that his father had fought at Waterloo. And Chard says, oh, they're still being a bit snipey with each other. And Chard says, look, I know what you're saying. You're the professional. I'm the amateur. And it's interesting because Bromhead, this aristocratic infantry officer, says, no, 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 you're missing my point. What I'm saying is... I wish I was a damn ranker, like Hitch or Hook, like with no responsibility. Which is quite an interesting sort of take on it, you know, uh, uh, publicly displaying his lack of confidence or his nervousness. Mm -hmm. Anyway, at this point, they fix bayonets and look up at a ridge and an incredibly dramatic scene. Um, a line of warriors is approaching the outpost. The warriors halt and start their menacing a segue on shield rattling noise. Yeah, the the, um, the Asagai is the stabbing she uh, spear they used. Mm -hmm. They did have throwing spears, but I'd, whether they were a bit like the Spartans, they saw them as womanly weapons, the yeah. ones you throw, but they, they seem to not combat. to have really used them, no. But that, that scene, you know, when, you, when they look up and the camera pans round and you've got regiment after regiment of these Zulus just appearing over the, the ridge, and you, it's, it's so awe-inspiring. So, someone tried to tell me that this movie had the most extras ever in a movie, maybe at the time it was made, it was, but yeah. that, that, that gong goes to Gandhi that had 300,000 extras. Yeah. But yeah. there were an awful lot of I um, think Zulu warriors. might have had that at mm. some stage as well. Certainly yeah. Zulu Dawn had a heck of a lot of extras. And this is all pre CGI, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're all portrayed, all the people portraying Zulu warriors pretty much are Zulu warriors at the yeah. time, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I mean, Ketchweo in, I think, Zulu Dawn was played by the. I'm trying to think of his name, oh, but it, yeah, the, the the reigning Zulu king at, at the, the time, time in the seventies. So, uh, yeah. Butalazi, Butalazi, that's yeah. it. Who yeah, went I on to right. be big in politics? Um, yeah. Post so the Zulu start to approach on a signal from a chief up on the hillside. Um, Bromhead orders the flank facing those Zulus to open fire, and as they do, the Zulus halt, like plant their spears in the ground. The Rasa guys in the in the ground stand still, chanting as the British troops are like tearing into them with volley fire and then independent fire at will. So, so Bromhead wants to figure out why they're not uh, attacking at this time, why they've assaulted. And he asks the Boer, um, Adendorf, why the Zulus aren't coming on. Adendorf answers that the old boy on the hill is counting their guns. He's assessing the British firepower with the uh, lives of some of his warriors. Yeah, and at this stage, um, the wits uh, are finally, after this first attack, if you like, it's not really an attack, but um, wit starts up again and he's very three sheets to the wind, he's very yep. drunk 
and Charles says to Callis Artborn, put the wits on their cart, send them away. Bromhead says, you can't send them out there, they won't stand a chance. And Charles' answer is, well, they're his parishioners, aren't they? And it looks really brutal, yeah. but the wits do leave, and um, he has another parting shot, after which uh, a young trooper asks Colour Sergeant Bourne. Um, I think he's looking for some reassurance, yeah. and I can't really say he gets, gets it, it this time, but here we go. You're all going to die! He's right. Die! Why is it, I say? Because we're here, lad. Nobody else. Just us. So, finally the wits leave uh, and are unmolested by the mounting Zulu warriors around them. So maybe we should pause the narrative of the movie now and see how they've handled this bit in, historically. Yeah, I mean, going back to uh, the sentries coming in and, you know, the, they stand to and they realise what is coming, they fix bayonets, Many accounts of the battle from officers and rankers alike do say that this was the stage where they suffered the most intense fear and imaginations running wild. Um, they seem to have quickly overcome this and I do find it incredible and lots of the soldiers accounts give credit to Chard, Bromhead, Dalton, Bourne, you know, that the officers and senior NCOs and they were saying we were never left to our own thoughts and wild imaginations for long before one of them was round checking we were okay. Yeah, that comes across they, in the film, especially yeah. through Bourne. And I mean, one of the, I think it's Fred Hitch says, whilst he was shooting, he never put his hand in his pouch without finding ammunition there. Yeah, always and being replenished. Yeah, it's always been replenished and Dalton and his cook, whilst the cook was still alive, were going around, they're actually putting the rounds in the guy's pouches, it's incredible. Um, another incredible thing is Bromhead's father genuinely was a Cavalry subaltern, junior lieutenant at Waterloo, and I'm thinking, he must have been a very old man. Well, certainly went well into his middle age before he fathered Bromhead, right. who was um, not born till, if he was 34, he was born in, in 45, 45 44, 1844, yeah. Okay. So nearly 30 years after in Waterloo. Waterloo, so... Yeah, interesting. Okay, and what about, uh, and we've already seen the soldiers getting ready for the uh, Zulus coming and they fixed their bayonets. Um, they would have been using Martini Henry rifles? Yeah, it was relatively new. Um, it fired a 45 calibre round, 0.45 of an inch, and it, that's a, it's a heck of a punch. That, yeah. They're very powerful. And but it's been... also, it's a four foot rifle with, sorry, the, the, yeah, no, that's right, I think. I think the rifle's four foot. Then they put what was called the lunger bay in it. Which is shown as quite long and deadly in the movie. Yeah, and that actually gave them a greater reach than the stabbing assegais primarily used by the Zulus, and that, that did prove very significant. I read somewhere, you know, where they have these gotcha moments where you see someone in a movie wearing a, a watch that mm. they shouldn't be or something like that, and we're not that sort of a podcast, but they, I did read somewhere about the Martini Henry rifles. They tried to use them wherever possible in the filming of the movie, right? but they only had... Um, half as many as they wanted. So yeah. if you're very clever, all the so shot, everything shot from the left side is Martini Henry's and correct, and everything from the right side is like something Lee much more modern. Something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's interesting. Um, also, the image of the Zulu chief, who is shown as an old guy, even though Prince Dabalamanzi, who, who by then was commanding, um, was only about 40. Uh, the idea that he used his warriors to assess the defenders' firepower is purely fiction. Um, and very, I find it strangely out of step with the pretty positive view the movie gives of the courage and determination and the skill of the Zulus. You yeah. know, that they're not fanatical automatons. And they're not portrayed as um, subhuman, unintelligent. No, they were beasts, highly skilled, motivated. As they were shown. And they used cover superbly. Yeah. The Brits said, wow. Um, That's shown in the film too. Yeah. Though. And of course, all the stuff with wit and preaching and all this is completely yeah, just, fictitious. Just to repeat that wit left uh, Rourke's Drift before the first battle broke out. He's much younger. He's about 30, I think. He does have children, but not obviously not the adult no. portrayed in the movie, and they're 20 miles away with his wife. Yes. And he's gone off to join them before the battle starts. Yeah, absolutely. And going quite understandably. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. you know. There was uh, no criticism of him at but, the time. But there have been some criticisms of him as a reliable witness since. Because uh, yeah. the implication was he kind of tried to, maybe not cash in monetarily, but cash in... Um, Reputation-wise? Reputation-wise afterwards, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, back to the movie? 
Yep, back to the movie. Okay, next we see the Zulus launch a faint attack on the same side as previously, but they go to ground as soon as uh, the British start firing at them. Uh, then we see a force making their way forward in dead ground using the nearby path as a stream. Uh, that Zulu's making their way forward through the path. Yeah. Shard and Bromhead realise that they're being surrounded. Uh, Adendorf, Lieutenant Adendorf, the Boer, reminds them about the Zulu tactic. Horns of the buffalo closing in on them to encircle them. Shots start to come from the hillside above. Uh, so clearly now they realise that the Zulus have got more than just a spear and a, and a shield. They've also got some rifles. Yeah. Uh, Bromhead asks um, Adendorf, where the hell would the Zulus have gotten rifles from? And Adendorf replies, from the bodies of your men at Izantuana. Yeah, and at this stage, Chard orders Bromhead to form a flying platoon of good bayonet men to plug any gaps. Um, Corporal Hitch, uh, sorry, Corporal Allen and Private Hitch are both hit by the Zulu marksmen. Hitch had jumped up on, onto the top of the uh, mealy bag wall to get a better view. And they're both then hit and they're taken to where Surgeon Reynolds has set up his surgery in the church. Um, and then the Zulus finally launch a proper attack at the north wall. A lot of them get to the defensive wall, some get over, and we see Colossal Bourne leading the defence with rifle and bayonet. And then Bromhead charges with his flying platoon, his reserve platoon, to plug the gap. Um, Chard then finds himself attacked by two Zulus and is knocked to the ground. The final Asagai thrust is blocked by Corporal Schweiss. She's, she's, she's thank the you. Swiss, uh, yeah, the Swiss Natal native guy. With his crutch, uh, blocked by Schweiss. She's, she's. Um, uh, yeah, she's now has uh, an injured foot. Um, and Just sort of hobbling his yeah, knees, with the, he uses with the crutch the, to block the guy, trailing. and then a rifle and bayonet to... And somehow manages to send dispatch two Zulu warriors after him. Yeah. Bromhead finally says to the wounded Shard, we need you. Shard, less than graciously, says, you wanted command? Take it. Yeah, Shard's then taken to the church because he, he's... Uh, it's not quite clear what wound he's got. Yeah. He's, he's got blood on him and he's obviously been partially knocked out. Um, Surgeon Reynolds, who's treating a mortally wounded soldier who basically dies on the on the, operating table. On the operating table and he calls Chard a butcher. And so There's a little bit of introspection of the film at this... But for the moment, Chard's out of action. Um, back at the wall, the uh, Zulus finally retreat. And as soon as they do, the Zulu riflemen up on the hill um, start to renew their shooting. And then there's some humorous complaining of, uh, from, from the soldiers at this stage. Um, almost immediately, the next scene shows the Zulus facing the south wall um, in an attack. Uh, the sick inside the hospital start to fire as well, defending themselves. Yeah. During this attack, Assistant Commission Commissariat Dalton is hit. Shortly afterwards, his cook is shot and killed. The wounded Dalton continues to drag his ammunition box around, handing out rounds to the men. Yeah. Um, Chard has recovered enough to go outside the, the church and he, Corporal Allen and Private Hitch, who were both wounded and had their wounds dressed by now, um, they crawl across it. Well, Corporal Allen says, can you walk? And Hitch says, well, do you want me to walk far? And he said, no, that's right. He says, can you crawl, I think. Yeah. And he says, come on. And they go and get the ammunition box from Dalton, who's struggling to crawl with this ammo box, and they take over. Um, Chard resumes command and another attack comes in. And then Chard has Colour Sergeant Bourne form two ranks behind the mealy bag wall. And those two ranks formed up, put volley fire into the, the Zulu attack. Uh, and this way they beat it, beat back the attack that, that doesn't really get to hand to hand. It's all kind of relentless and bloody and never ending the waves of attacks in the movie at this stage. Yeah. But at this stage we see the Zulus retreat, but defiantly chanting back at the British when they go. Shard has the men rebuild the wall. The tired men um, have to rally once again. Bourne protests that the lads are very tired. Shard says, I don't give a damn, and orders a nine-foot wall with firing steps. Yep, and, uh, and at this stage it's sort of starting to look towards dusk. Mm. So you get the impression that... The, and then of course, South Africa in January, this is midsummer. Yep. So um, very hot. Uh, inside the hospital, Private Hook says... God, look, we're the blind spot. We're next, boys. Even if them flaming officers ain't seen it, I bet the Zulus have. And sure enough, um, they, they uh, the, the lads are looking out towards the Zulus. 
Yeah, then you have one of these... Diversions? Yeah, there's one of the Welsh soldiers who was up on the sentry point earlier was talking about a calf that's been poorly and he's gone out to um, the cattle corral. He's obviously a farm lad and this calf, it's either died or it's been shot and and he's quite sad and then they call stand two again, get back to your positions, fix bayonets and everything. So he he goes to return inside the stockade but he leaves the gate, he, he tries to hook the gate chain over but it falls off so the gate's slightly ajar. That that will prove significant in a scene coming up shortly. So almost immediately the Zulus attack again, concentrating on the hospital wall. They hoist some warriors onto the roof of the hospital and um, get its thatched roof and start to set fire to it. Bromhead and some of his flying platoon go up to engage the Zulus on the roof. Sergeant Windridge, a big burly man, wrestles some warriors off the roof and punches another in full in the face. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's almost a bit of a sort of slapstick comedy moment. Yeah. Um, wrestling around and the warriors are making holes in the roof uh, in the thatch start to drop inside the hospital and it's a horribly confused and close quarter fight in there and the lads realise that they there's no common corridor and um, so they start to dig through the walls with their bayonets and they're kind of dragging the injured guys the wounded guys or the sick guys through and they go from room to room um, but they can't get everybody out and basically they say, look, we've got to get out of here, the place is on fire. So we have Hook and his buddy, John Williams, they're the rear guard. Hook tries to go back for Sergeant Maxfield, who's shouting, Hook, I told you I'd make a soldier of you. He obviously has some personal history, but he goes back from him nonetheless, killing several Zulus in the process. But then the roof caves in and Hook's forced back and he watches as Maxfield is stabbed. Uh, and Hook is the last man inside the hospital and he goes to the medicine cabinet where there's brandy where he smashes the neck of the bottle and drinks it and Williams comes back and goes what are you doing Hooky? That's a, that's a flogging offence and you're thinking I'm inside a burning building being attacked by several thousand Zulus I don't think a court martial is my biggest concern which I think is his expression The fighting then continues outside until a, the bugler is ordered to sound the retreat and that sees the soldiers fall back from the outer wall. At this stage, the cattle run free uh, and they interrupt the Zulu attack. They trample some warriors and break the impetus. Um, You can see the dead calf that you already mentioned and um, I don't think this is one of those films where they can put their hand on the heart and say, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. We see the opening scene where there's a cheetah that's been shot by the Michael Caine character. They're and shot at, but it escapes. It, he misses no, no, it. He, they bring it in, hold it I up. I thought that was their deer or an antelope. There were both. There was ah, the first, the, right. first the cheetah, Got you. and then an antelope, right. and now we've seen the, the calf and some, yes. some um, bulls being gored by each other and goring the Zulus. Yeah. yeah. Pretty dramatic stuff. Yeah, it's different ages, isn't it, I suppose? Yeah. Um, so night falls and the hospital continues to burn and I think before we go on to the next phase of the film we should just say about um, you know we, on the reality check we don't need to go through each attack in detail but suffice to say that Zulus are incredibly determined very skilled and and what is shown well in the film is some Zulus will appear and the lads will, you know the lads on that wall will shout here they come and they'll all look over and go hang on where have they gone and they'll use they'll use feints. So yeah. one one side will stand up, then they'll drop back into cover, and then another side will attack. Yeah. Um, and several soldiers reported that the Zulu warriors would get to the wall and actually grab at their rifles, trying to wrench them out of the soldiers' hands. And that's shown in the film, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if they had a round in the chamber, they could shoot them off the end of the rifle, mm-hmm. quite literally, uh, and horrendous. I mean some of the descriptions in some of the accounts by soldiers of because for some of them it's the first time they'd used the martini henry in the the 45 box round mm. in but actual combat you see them in the movie loading each bullet after each round oh yeah, yeah. there's no obviously nothing automatic no repeating no. rifles or anything but like that but it's breech loading um and, and we'll um yeah I and mean, this brings us nicely on to the idea that the zulus were using martini henry's captured at his and one it's very unlikely because this impi were never involved. They would not have been able to loot the battlefield at Isandlwana. You said they were reserves from they the They were battle. held in reserve and they looped straight around and came for Rourke's Drift. They may have got a few from fugitives, but it's very unlikely that they got many cartridges. And that was one of the problems at Isandlwana is they ran out of ammunition. 
And if, so, if all the historical records and memoirs are just simply silent on that matter, we don't... You know, no-one's going to say, oh, we're surprised that the Zulus didn't have rifles, so we can't really confirm a negative. Well, they did have firearms. They yeah, but at that battle. But, but no, no, exactly. But I'm oh, sorry, do you mean at Isandwana? No, 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 at um, Rock's, Rock's Drift. Drift. Yeah, they had a lar- large number of firearms at Rock's Drift, but they don't think, if there were any Martini Henrys, there may have been a few carbines they I got see. from uh, the mounted troops, but they're short-barrelled to be used on a horse and not very accurate. Mm. They had, some of them had muskets, I mean, really dating back, they'd been sold by European arms traders, mm. um, arms dealers, and they did have some older rifles. Bromhead's flying platoon with Sergeant Wimridge is absolutely spot on, and it was, in truth, very successful at plugging gaps, reinforcing sections coming under pressure. Um, and Frederick Schies, the Swiss corporal, was reported to, he fought like a tiger throughout the whole thing apparently. But Dalton, interestingly, there's a bit in the scene where he says, hey, somebody pop that fellow. Well done, young man. Well, he did call that out, pop that fellow, but that's because he was busy bayoneting several mm-hmm. others. I mean, he, he he was absolutely getting stuck into it and he wasn't handing out ammunition. He was using it to shoot people. But What about the um, scene where Shard is wounded and... Yeah, he's confronted I, by the surgeon. No, no report that he's been. Uh, he's been. He was wounded significantly. Um, Corporal Allen and Private Hitch were hit, and they did drag ammunition boxes around. Um, the cook portrayed as Dalton's assistant. He was killed. Actually, he wasn't a cook. He was a stores corporal, but he was killed. But the feeling of constant attack after attack is very well portrayed. Um, Chard was constantly rebuilding and adjusting the defences. He did demand a nine foot wall with stop firing steps. He just seems to have stayed incredibly calm and focused and decisive throughout it all. Good portrayal of the fight in the hospital. Um, the bit that we're going to get, I mean, there's no suggestion that Hook swigged any brandy because he was teetotal yep. and he was well known for being, um, but he was the last man out. But in reality, night falls and the hospital's burning and these attacks apparently did not slow down the film always gives the impression that there are attacks through the night but yeah. not quite as regular it's like oh you know we've been having a bit of a kip and then oh here they come yeah. again but they did carry on through to the early hours of the morning at which point they stopped in reality right but in the film we're actually heading for the film's climax conclusion yep yeah so, I mean, really, dawn break, there have been a couple of uh, attacks in the night. We've heard Private Owen say to his mate, I think they got more guts than we have, Boyle. And then they have the plan with Chard and his tall wall. Dawn breaks and they can hear the shield crashing noise again, the train, as it were, and the Zulus are returned. So next, we're, sun is about, the sun's about to rise, I think, and, yeah. and the, we see some of uh, the troops asleep at their posts, exhausted by the relentless battle for many, many hours that they've had to endure. Um, Why are they awoken? Um, Because we can see more Zulus massing in the distance and you think they've got nothing more to give. This surely has to be their end. Um, The Zulus that are coming, menacingly coming, are initially silent. Um, The impression given that they are surrounded, surrounding the men. Um, A a haunting song starts up from the Zulus and in one of the film's most famous scenes Shard approaches Private Owen and listening to the Zulu singing he asks if the Welsh couldn't do a better job. Owen's laconic reply is that they have a terrific bass section but no top tenors that's for sure. I can't do a Welsh accent. (laughs) Before before his men strike up with men of Harlech. Quickly, um, it catches and all the men join in. And probably one of the most iconic films in this and this, many other films. This scene, yeah. yeah. So uh, we're just going to have a quick listen to that.
So the Zulus build themselves up with a more, more energetic chanting and then launch themselves into the attack, which we just sort of heard the start of at the end of that clip. Um, the soldiers behind their wall start firing and then Bromhead, he starts to volley fire. Chard has his bugler next to him and at the prearranged point or at a certain point, he gives him the order to give a bugle call. And what happens at that stage is the... Uh, outer rank who were defend who were firing the, f the volleys they run back to the outside of the newly built Tall nine foot the, wall. The wall hitherto hidden behind them were a second rank of soldiers or third rank sorry because the, fr the the guys outside that wall now form two one kneeling one st standing rank more guys appear over the top and they go into this just devastating uh, volley fire by ranks yeah. and I mean we, we've got a short clip here and it's a little bit noisy obviously but it just gives you an idea of even a relatively small, this is one company of infantry and not all of them obviously because they've got to watch the other walls as well but this is what it can sound like um, and some people will tell you this is what won Britain an empire. Volley by ranks! One rank! Fire! So clearly the strategy of the higher wall to fall back to with some fresh men to alternate with the other men uh, has worked. Um, they've defended their position once again. Um, a, cease order for, a ceasefire order is given and the camera pans across a scene of piles of Zulu bodies, some still moving um, and a shocked looking line of soldiers. Next scene, uh, with the Zulus having been absent now for three hours, it shows the British soldiers out in the field picking up Zulu shields and they're stabbing a sagais. Colour Sergeant Bourne starts to call the role immediately back into military SNCO role. Senior NCO, sorry. Thank yeah. you, Senior NCO. Uh, it's a nice touch when Hughes answers, Colour Sergeant, and Bourne retorts with, Say, sir, officer on parade. Yeah, yeah, spot on. Meanwhile, Shard and Bromhead stand in the burnt-out hospital and talk about their feelings. Bromhead says he feels sick and ashamed. He asks Shard if it was the same for him, the first time. Shard then confesses that this is also his first action. Um, during the roll call, Shard and Bromhead look up to see the entire Zulu Impi return to line the ridge. Um, and they're kind of horrified. Bromhead starts hysterically laughing and saying, Come on, come on then. And then Chard wants to know what's happening. He's asked Ardendorf why the Zulus have, have stopped. Initially, Ardendorf sinks to the ground and says, damn you, can't you see it's over, we're finished, you know, we can't withstand another attack. And then he realises that actually the Zulus aren't in attack mode at all. They're saluting fellow braves and they all sort of... And then the Zulus, survive. yeah, they turn quietly away and they walk away. And then we hear Richard Burton's wonderfully rich voice list... Um, or give the details at the end of the battle, list the 11 Victoria Crosses that were awarded um, on that day and the names of those people. Um, and I suppose really we should go back and just do the... For those of you that don't know, I think it's correct to say that the Victoria Cross is the supreme medal you can be given in the Commonwealth country. Uh, for military. For yeah, military it's, for, it's for action in the face of the enemy. In the field, yeah. yeah. Um, and Australians, distinct... women and Canadians get the... Yeah. Yeah, and Britain and Commonwealth uh, award them. Um, it's, uh, legend has it they, they, their guns, uh, Russian guns from Sebastopol yeah. in the Crimean War, is the bronze down. that they're made of. Um, Probably you know, the, true. Yeah, um, but to go, just go back to the uh, reality check. Yeah. Night fell, attacks did go on to the early hours of the morning, then they, in reality they stopped and the Zulus were still around. They, they saw them at times, but there were no more attacks. Um, so, the the whole scene with the Zulus singing their war songs and the the Welsh regiment responding with terrific song, Men of Harlot. Unfortunately, it's, it's completely fictitious, yeah. but it is. I think it's it's a 
it's two groups of incredibly brave and skilled fighters yeah. building themselves up for one last effort. Um, and that dramatic um, appearance, the final appearance of the Zulus in the movie and then saluting their fellow braves and walking away, that's, yeah, that, that's a fiction that, too. That is a fiction, um, although they certainly had tremendous respect. respect. Both groups had tremendous respect for each other. Interestingly, if they had come back and attacked, there were 900 rounds of spare ammunition right. left Not when long. when they were relieved the next day Not by a, a cavalry column coming from Help Macau. The lovely touch of Private Hugh saying, just call a sergeant, and Bourne saying, Off, say sir, officer on praise, absolutely right. Oh, Very wow. small technical point, but absolutely right. It's nice that that was used. Uh, and we also didn't see when the scene with the soldiers collecting the shields and the acid guys, yeah. in reality, they also went round and either shot or bayoneted to death the any wounded Zulus. There were virtually no prisoners taken no, by no. either side throughout the war, which today's, to today's sensibilities is brutal. Yeah. It's the way they both fought. Mm. Uh, there was no call to given or, or expected. And Quechuao later would describe the victory at Izanguana combined with the defeat at Rourke's Drift as wounds in the belly of our nation. Um, I mean, it, the, Izanguana was a Pyrrhic victory if ever there was one. Mm. Um, Pyrrhus, obviously, the, the chap who keep be kept beating Roman right. armies, and but they just kept raising more. At an incredible cost to his own men. Yeah. On the VCs, there were 11 awarded. It's the most ever awarded for a single action. No, it's not the most ever awarded for a single day, but for a single action it is. Interestingly, during D-Day, 68,000 British and Commonwealth troops were involved in action on D-Day. There was one VC given. Wow. There were 140 British and European troops at Rourke's Drift, 11 were given. You, you nearly had a 1 in 10 chance of getting the VC if you, if you survived. I, I have read somewhere that, um, given the terrible uh, defeat that they'd had the day before, and then this miraculous survival the next day that there was a deliberate spin on the victory and the heroes and the number of VC winners of the next day to help yep. salve the, 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 the pain of having lost so many men comprehensively to the Zulus that had um, fall. We mentioned earlier talking about the sources that historians are very divided and you'll read, you know, the, the absolute heroes, they, 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 the fact that they just didn't give up, they kept fighting hand to hand a lot of it as well mm. um, it were you know just incredible and the, the thought that Chard and Bromhead and Dalton put into it I mean they thoroughly deserved it a few have said can't believe that Colour Sergeant Bourne didn't get the VC yeah. I've read in, in two or three accounts that he was offered a VC and actually declined it yeah, possibly that aware that they were being devalued by the number being given I'm not sure he got the Distinguished Conduct Medal which it, medal, would, it wouldn't have stopped his second. military career anyway, would it? Having oh, God, it, no, it no. would have only enhanced it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it, his official approach was, I did nothing but my job. Right. Um, you know, very noble. I did it very well, maybe. But whereas Private Hitch, Private Hook, um, the Williams brothers did go, uh, the old thing was above and beyond the call of duty yeah, okay. in the best traditions of the service, etc. Child and Bromhead, I think, I mean, Bromhead at one point, Hitch couldn't fire a rifle because he'd been wounded. So he gave his revolver to Hitch. He said, well, I've got a rifle and bayonet. I'm in the flying platoon. Take my revolver and gave him some rounds. He really does seem to have cared about his men, looked after them, known them, well, Stan, worked well with them. And Stanley and, Baker obviously had a high regard for the historical characters that yeah, he portrayed, including... And, and he accepted that Chard was in charge and very quickly they started working together. The only thing the film does is downplays Dalton's role. And Dalton was quite um, key. Uh, Chaplain Smith went round handing out ammunition because um, he, he meant to leave, but then found out that his servant and his horse were both mysteriously missing when he got yeah, down right. off the hill at the beginning. Well, did you come across any of the interesting trivia associated with the movie and um, Baker as the producer? And you know that apparently, according to movie mythology, all of the extras had pretty much never seen a motion picture before, didn't know what on earth they were trying to do. So apparently, um, Baker, as the producer, uh, arranged for some screenings, open air screenings of silent movies. Right. Yeah, like uh, Laurel and Hardy and the like, and they went down a huge treat. And also, this is um, apartheid, South Africa. Yeah. So the Zulus weren't um, entitled for payment, they weren't allowed to go into cinemas to see their own movie. So the producers of this film ensured, I, I'm, I hope I'm getting the facts right, that 
everyone involved was paid something in maybe cattle or livestock or in mm-hmm. kind. And apparently Baker managed to get a, a screening for the extras and they did get to see their movie somewhere. He, he's a, certainly, the more I read about Sir, Sir Stanley Baker as he became, a fascinating character. I, I don't know, I wonder if Simone Higgins has done an episode. Simone, have you done an episode on Sir Stanley Baker? And if not, please could you do one so we can Good call. find out about him. I, I think you have to take your hat off as, from a military perspective to both sides for doing and one of the things the Zulus learned that going up against a properly prepared defensive position was no, very good. very risky uh, what I think the British learned was if you're in a properly prepared defensive position you can take on much larger numbers of Zulus but uh, is Andwana if you're not expect to have a horrible horrible shock because these people are not messing. Chelmsford was massively criticised by Sir Garnet Wolsey, who was head of the army at the time. He was the senior general commanding. He shipped out to take over, but by the time he did that, Chelmsford had regrouped, re-entered Zululand and defeated them at Ulundi, which took the wind out of Wolsey's sails. And Wolsey had nothing good to say about pretty much anyone involved in the South African Zulu campaign other than the rankers. Okay. The Chard and Bromhead he described as stupid dull fellows who didn't impress him at all. But Chard went to, back to London, he had at least three audiences with Queen Victoria. Um, Queen Victoria visited Private Hitch in hospital. Wow. She, uh, she, I mean, she was famous for looking after her boys as right. she thought of them and looking after them. I, I think Chard and Bromhead did rather well. If I'd have been able to just focus and be a damn ranker and farm a rifle in the face of that fear, especially on the back of, they just lost a whole bunch of their mates. Yeah, within the day. And the, the Ian Knight book that, that was uh, out, I think, in the 80s is very good. There's nothing, nothing remains but to fight. It, it was a kind of, right. what back else are we going to do? Mm. Well, the, the film makes plain there's about between three and 4,000 Zulus mm. coming on um, the encampment. It doesn't actually say how many British soldiers in the movie, around about 100? 130 to 140 of whom uh, about 20 were invalids of varying degrees. Of right. in, I mean, Max, Sergeant Maxfield was, was delirious with fever and absolutely unable to participate. Corporal Sheese had a wounded, had a hurt foot and uh, he fought like a lion, you know. Yeah. Um, I did say tiger earlier, I think lion is more appropriate, but seeing as they're on Africa. I mean, marks out of 10. Entertainment, oh, I think it's, it, great. It's, it's a nine. Yeah, it's a nine. For me, Agreed. it's a nine. It's, me too. it's really good. I may have seen it sometime in the past, but I was watching it with fresh eyes recently for this podcast, and it was really entertaining. And as, you, as, as we say, it stands up very well in the days of CGI and special effects. It yeah. still is great. And for a 64 film being made in apartheid South Africa, I think is actually about as balanced as... Now, I'm sure if we were sat here with a Zulu historian, he would... He's saying you call Tear that holes, balanced, yeah. and I think well compared to what well, Zack Snyder's three hundred, yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah. actually it, it more doesn't positive than the enemy. you might expect. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. vilify the enemy. That's for sure. No, no, there's no goodies and baddies, no. and it also sort of does major on the tragedy of of, of war conflict. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we both give it nine for entertainment. Oh, what about history? Really, it's pretty close. Again, the, there's some really great details. Some no, the names of correct and line up they haven't added any romantic interest to propel the movie or? no they have created an entirely fictional second day and yes, they true. have created <laughs> and that a whole, whole thing scene. with Otto Witt yeah um, okay. the fact that they were Welsh when in yeah, fact that's a big not, the only my explanation for that I don't think is please believe me I don't see anything sinister in it but I think the Hollywood producers or Stanley Bacon and Seinfeld have looked at it and they've gone 24th of foot, oh, all, the, all the British Army regiments have amalgamated that many times. What are they part of? Royal Regiment of Wales. What were they called that before that? South Wales Borderers. Oh, Brecon's in South Wales. That's where they were based. Okay. That must, that be, must Welsh. be them. Because Richard Burton at the end, a and, Welshman. and everyone's about to hear um, the wonderful Richard Burton's voice, or Richard Burton's wonderful voice, he says, uh, Gonville Bromhead, Lieutenant, 24th of foot, South Wales Borderers. And they weren't. They were the Second Warwickshire Regiment at the time. Two years, two years later, then they became the South Wales Right. Brothers. And so. well, making them a bit more Welsh than they really were probably plays to that whole 
fiction about having a choir and oh, wanting a baritone yeah. and all that. Yeah. <sighs> History, I, I can't go higher than seven. No, I, I was going to go higher until this closing conversation. I agree, seven. Yeah. It's good, but it's not perfect. But 18 out of 20 on, on entertainment uh, is... What it's all about. Yeah, well, it's 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, which is, which is not a forgiving website. You've no. got to be pretty good to get up there. So, two weeks' time, Cameron Riley will be joining us to look at the battle that changed the future of Europe, the Battle of Waterloo, Another 1960s, 70s, huge war epic. War, war epic, um, and this had 16,000 extras in it or something. But until then, what yes we do, we will go out with a list of the men and officers who were awarded the Victoria Cross at Rourke's Drift. Not forgetting Prince Danby Lumanza and his Zulu warriors, but this is Richard Burton listing the officers, and then I think there's a little bit more of uh, male voice choir mm. singing Men of Harley. So, thank you very much, everybody. Any ideas for films, please fire them into us. Hosts at historybyhollywood.com or Martin at historybyhollywood.com or Andrew at historybyhollywood.com. We'll, all those will get to us. Thanks for your time and uh, see you next time. Thanks, then. Bye bye. In the hundred years since the Victoria Cross was created for valour and extreme courage, beyond that normally expected of a British soldier in face of the enemy. Only 1,344 have been awarded. Eleven of these were won by the defenders of the mission station at Rourke's Drift, Natal, January 22nd to the 23rd, 1879. Frederick Schies, Corporal, Natal Native Contingent. William Allen, Corporal, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot. Fred Hitch, Private, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot. James Langley Dalton, Acting Assistant Commissary, Army Commissariat Department, 612 John Williams, Private, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot, 716 Robert Jones, 593 William Jones, Privates, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot, Henry Hook, Private, B Company, 2nd Battalion, 24th Foot, James Henry Reynolds, Surgeon Major, Army Hospital Corps. Gonville Bromhead, Lieutenant, B Company, 2nd Battalion of the 24th Regiment of Foot, South Wales Borderers. John Rouse Marriott Chard, Lieutenant, Royal Engineers, Officer Commanding, Rourke's Drift.